But from the fourth century onwards, communion grew less brief. Once Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, there was a danger of falling standards, a danger of Christians becoming, people becoming Christians simply because it was of worldly advantage so to do. And in order to protect the Holy Sacrament from the fourth century onwards, there was an increasing emphasis on the need for preparation on the possible obstacles for communion. Already at the end of the fourth century, St. John Chrysostom complains that many people only come for the sacrament once a year. But the tradition of frequent communion continued. St. Simeon the New Theologian in the 11th century wanted his monks to receive communion daily. In the 18th century, the renewal movement on the Holy Mountain and elsewhere, the movement of the Kalivade, they too urged frequent and even daily communion, not only for monks, but for lay people. St. Macarius of Corinth and St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, leading members of the Colivades movement, the editors of the Philokalia, wrote on the subject of frequent communion, or as they called it, continual communion. At that time, in the Turkish period, the normal practice was for people to have communion only three or four times a year. The Kolivadis were attacked for their teaching on frequent communion. But they were justified by the Holy Synod at Constantinople in 1819, which said in an official decision that in principle, Orthodox Christians may receive communion at every celebration of the divine liturgy, provided they are properly prepared. So, what about ourselves? It is to me a cause for happiness that in the Orthodox Church in the 20th century there has been a widespread revival of frequent communion. But don't let us go too far. Don't let it become automatic. There is a great spiritual value in non-communicating attendance at the divine liturgy. If sometimes you do not receive, then that deepens and intensifies the moment when you do. Certainly to my own people, I would offer this guidance. An Orthodox Christian in good standing should come for communion at least once a month. Do not leave it longer than that. It is possible, with a blessing, to come every Sunday. But perhaps it's better to come on alternative. Sunday. How should we prepare? There are four things that we do. First, there are prayers of preparation before communion. There is a canon appointed to be said the night before. And then there are three psalms and a number of prayers to be said on the morning before communion. The exact number of the prayers varies in different editions of the Orthodox prayer books. There may be eight or there may be twelve. I do not see these prayers as a fixed measure that must be said as a matter of obligation. 
But I think the prayer should not be totally omitted. We should never come to communion without having said at least some of the prayers. Perhaps you don't need to say them all on the morning before communion. You can spread them out during the week before. But it scandalizes me that many Orthodox Christians are unaware of these prayers and do not use them. That surely is a mark of the decline of our spiritual life today. Then, secondly, it is possible to prepare for Holy Communion through the sacrament of confession. Here the custom varies in different parts of the Orthodox Church. There is no canon that requires confession before communion. There is no canon, known to me at any rate, which makes confession obligatory. And so far as I can discover, in the Byzantine Church and in the Greek tradition, it has never been required as an obligation that people must go to confession before communion. In the Russian church and in other Slavonic churches, Serbian church, it has very often been regarded as necessary to go to confession. Here, as before, we must follow the custom of our own community, the guidance of our own spiritual father. Partly it depends how often you're going for communion. But at least sometimes confession should form part of our preparation for communion. It's a deep sorrow for me that in many parts of the Orthodox Church today, the sacrament of confession is neglected. There are many Orthodox Christians who imagine that you only go to confession at times of great crisis. But in fact, we should see the sacrament of confession as the normal part of the life of every Christian, not just as a remedy, for desperate situation. This sacrament, which is such a source of grace, is too much neglected by Orthodox Christians today. And if there are here tonight, present in church, Orthodox Christians who have not been to confession for a long time, then I urge you all to search your conscience and come to confession before Easter. We shouldn't see confession as a duty, but as a privilege. Confession is an opportunity to experience the compassion and the forgiveness of Christ our Savior. Confession is not a hard burden. On the contrary, it takes the burden from our souls. It opens a door before us. Surely, confession is a gift of God's grace that we dare not refuse. When Christ offers us forgiveness, dare we say, I will not come. That's the way we would look at confession. Not, I suppose I ought to go. But Christ invites, and how much I have to gain by that. Of course, the advice of the spiritual father in confession is important. But much more important is what Christ does. Forgiveness that he extends. What I said in my first talk about Christ as the invisible celebrant applies also to the sacrament of confession. 
when the priest lays his hand on your head in absolution, do not think it is the priest who puts his hand on your head. It is Christ himself who is blessing you. Then, thirdly, we prepare for communion through fast. The canons prescribe no specific fast before communion. If you read the canons, you will find that we are told to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays, except on certain days of the year, and we are told that there are four particular periods of fast, of which the most important is the great fast of Lent, which we are now feasting. If Christians are keeping those fasts, and if they are coming regularly to communion, say, every week or twice a month, then perhaps it is sufficient for them simply to keep the appointed fasts as far as they can. And they need not have a special fast before communion. For those who come to the communion regularly, perhaps it is enough with the blessing of your spiritual father to keep the fast on Wednesday and Friday and then to come to communion. St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain speaks of fasting three days before communion, strictly without having oil. And this is very often quoted, three days without oil, in Greek circles. But St. Nicodemus gave that direction to people who had not been to communion for a long time, for many months or even years. Of course, they must prepare more carefully, more elaborately than people who come regularly. He never meant it as a rule for those who are going weekly or monthly. As regards fasting, let me offer you three guidelines. First, don't make it too easy. Remember what it says in the Psalms, I will not offer the Lord that which costs me nothing. Think of what the German Lutheran Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his great book, The Cost of Discipleship, about cheap grace. He said, cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church in our day. We are not here to preach cheap grace. We are here to preach costly grace not cheap forgiveness at cut-rate prices. So, there is need for genuine sacrifice, for cross-bearing. All of us are called to the ascetic. But then I would add two other things. Secondly, don't be a Pharisee. Don't be ostentatious about your fast. Remember what Christ said about fasting in secret. And that is particularly important for those of us who live at home or uh, are at work with people who are not orthodox. For people who are in mixed marriages or who have to eat at their place of work in the canteen. There we have to exercise a certain economia. Don't draw attention to yourself. Don't cause inconvenience to others. And that we can often do by demanding especially cooked meals. Let us remember that our Lord was extremely loving and generous to everybody in the gospel, to the tax collectors and the prostitutes, but to
to one group alone was he severe, the Pharisees and the hypocrites. So we are not to be ostentatious in our fasting. We are not to cause inconvenience or embarrassment to others. If you go to eat in someone else's house during a fast, then eat what is put before you. However, there is a difference between eating what is put before you and putting yourself before what is eaten. And then a third guideline for fasting. Don't damage your health. If you find through fasting you become tired, faint, if you have headache, then it's clear that you are fasting in the wrong way. Our health is a gift from God. We must treasure it and watch over it. And the difficulties here in the West when people have to travel many miles to church in winter, if you have to drive 60 miles to church, it's perhaps not a good idea to be totally fasting. If the liturgy is late, it may be a problem. So here, if you find difficulty in keeping a total fast before on the morning of communion, speak to your parish priest or your spiritual father. Let us remember that fasting is only a means. We are not to make it into an end. The aim of fasting is to enable us to communicate with fervor and compunction, with satanic. If we fast so strictly that we feel ill and cannot communicate with fervor and devotion, Something has gone wrong. The end is worthy communion. Well, there's never worthy communion. The end is attentive communion. Fasting is only the means. And remember what is said in Scripture, what Christ says to each one of us. My child, give me your heart. The Savior looks not at our ex Eternal bodily state. He looks at our inner condition, our state of heart. That is what matters in our preparation for communion. Creating me, O Lord, a clean heart. And then there is a fourth thing in preparing for communion. Reconciliation and forgiveness. Christ tells us clearly in the Sermon on the Mount, if you come with your gift to the altar and you remember that you have something against your brother or sister, leave your gift, first go and be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer it at the altar. So we should not come to communion without seeking reconciliation with our brothers and sisters, without asking for gifts. And it is very significant that at different moments in the liturgy, the celebrant asks for forgiveness from the congregation. When the priest comes out in front of the holy icons, to say the prayers of preparation before he puts on his vestment. He turns and bows to the people before he enters the sanctuary. And when he turns and bows, he is asking their forgiveness. Often when I do this, no one has yet arrived in church. But I can ask forgiveness from the end. Then again, Join him as a cherubim. After sensing the church, before the celebrant goes to the table of preparation 
to bring the holy gift to the altar. He turns and bows once more. And he is once more asking your forgiveness. Again, before he receives communion, so often you don't see this because the gates are closed, he turns and bows and asks forgiveness. And those three moments when the celebrants ask forgiveness of the people and they bow in return, giving forgiveness and asking it, those are very important as symbolizing the spirit in which we come for communion, asking forgiveness. In the monastery, when I go to Patmos, before the monks receive communion, the lay monks, they will come round to the stalls of all the monks and bow to them and ask forgiveness, one by one. And in many parishes, I know, where it's the custom for the people to come up and venerate the icons before they have communion, they will again turn and bow to the people. It's not possible in all churches. A very large congregation to do this. But even if you don't outwardly bow, at least in your heart, ask forgiveness of your brothers and sisters before you come for the Holy Spirit. Then finally, what about our response? I've been speaking about preparation for four things that we do before prayers, confession, fasting, reconciliation. What about the response? Thanksgiving. There are many ways to define the human animal. Aristotle, I think, said that man was a logical animal. Other people have defined the human animal as an animal that laughs and weeps. It has a sense of humor and a sense of tragedy. But perhaps the best way to define the human animal is to say the human animal is a Eucharistic animal, an animal that is capable of giving its hand. Here let me quote some words from Dostoevsky, from his novel Notes from Underground. The hero, or rather the anti-hero, is Gentlemen, let us assume that man is not stupid. But if he isn't stupid, he is monstrously ungrateful all the same. He is phenomenally ungrateful. I often think that the best definition of man is a creature that has two legs and no sense of gratitude. And then he goes on a bit later to say, Man alone can utter curse. It is his privilege and the thing that chiefly distinguishes him from the other animal. Now all of that is very true. Very true of humans without Christ, without God. But if we are to look at humans as God made them, as God intends them to be, then we are to reverse everything that Dostoevsky says here by 180 degrees. And obviously he meant us to do that. The best definition of man is a creature that has two legs and a sense of gratitude. Man alone can utter blessing. It is his privilege and the thing that chiefly distinguishes him from the other animal. When we give thanks, then we express our essential humanity. It is no coincidence that in our daily prayers, we say right at the beginning, Glory to you, O God, glory to you. Prayer, says St. John of Conchette, is a state of continual gratitude. Think also of the last words of St. John Chrysostom. 
as he died in exile, in conditions of great physical hardship and pain. What were his last words? Roxa to Theo Pantonenete. Glory to God for everything. That's the spirit in which we should go out from Holy Communion. We are given special prayers of thanksgiving to be said after communion. Let us not neglect those prayers. They only take ten minutes to recite. Can you not give ten minutes for thanksgiving? In some churches the prayers are read in church, and you can stay and hear them there. But otherwise, read them at home, before the icons in your home, when you return. However, our thanksgiving needs to be expressed, not only in words, but in acts. Let us go forth in peace we say, at the end of the service. And that doesn't just mean the service is over. It means, rather, the liturgy after the liturgy is just beginning. We are to go out from the service to bring into the world the spirit of the liturgy that we have received. We spoke of the holy gifts. Gifts are for sharing. If you are really thankful, share with others the joy of the holy sacrament. Bring the peace of the divine liturgy out with you and communicate it with others. Eucharist is the beginning of cosmic transfiguration. We are to go out and by the grace of Christ transfigure the world round us. St. John Chrysostom speaks of two altars. There is, he says, one altar familiar to us all, which we hold in honor. That is the altar that stands in the church, in the sanctuary. We bow before this altar. We decorate it with gold and silver. We treat it with veneration. But, he continues, there is another altar. And this altar we ignore. We do not know it. We treat it with contempt. And yet, on this altar we can offer sacrifice every day. The second altar is, he says, the poor, those in need those in distress. If you really care about the Eucharist, then, having honored the altar in church, you will go out and show your thanksgiving by honoring this second altar, by sharing all the material blessings that you enjoy with those who are in need. Only if you do that, Will you really be giving thanks for the blessed sacrament? And now I end with words from the liturgy of St. James, which express our starting point tonight, our sense of awe and wonder and the fear of God. These are words that we also sing on Great Saturday at the Divine Liturgy. Let all mortal flesh keep silent and stand with fear and trembling and ponder nothing earthly. For the King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes forth to be sacrificed and given as food for the faithful. For him go the choirs of angels, with every principality and power, many-eyed cherubim and the six-winged seraphim, veiling their faces and proclaiming, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen.